Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's virtual author event presented in collaboration with Miami Book Fair, Lit Hub, and Culture Crusaders. Thank you for joining us and thank you for supporting a locally owned independent bookstore in Books and Books. Tonight, we have the great honor of hosting Lori Halls Anderson discussing her new graphic novel, Wonder Woman, Tempest Tossed, and Alex Sanchez dis discussing his first graphic novel, You Brought Me the Ocean. Lori Halls Anderson is a New York Times bestselling author whose writing spans young readers, teens, and adults. Combined, her books have sold more than 8 million copies. Her new book, Shout, has received widespread critical acclaim and Lori's eighth New York Times and is Lori's eighth New York Times bestselling book. Two of her novels, Speak and Chains, were National Book Award finalists, and Chains was shortlisted for the prestigious Carnegie Medal in the United Kingdom. Lori has been nominated for Sweden's Astrid Lingrid Memorial Award three times and select, was selected by the ALA for the Margaret A. Edwards Award. She has also been honored for her battles for intellectual freedom by the National Coalition Against Censorship and the National Council of Teachers of English. Alex Sanchez has published eight novels, including American Library Association Best Book for Young Adults, Rainbow Boys, and the Lambda Award winning So Hard to Say. His novel Bait won the Tomas Rivera Mexican American Book Award and the Florida Book Award Gold Medal uh, for young adult fiction. He has a master's degree in guidance and counseling and worked for many years as a youth and family counselor. Before I hand this over to Lorraine Alex, there's a couple of buttons I wanna mention. The first is on the right hand um, in the bottom, it says ask a question. And this is the feature we're gonna be using tonight for the Q&A portion. Uh, so please send in any you have now or that come to mind during the conversation, we'll make sure we ask them. And then lastly, and most importantly, I'll remind you that you can order a copy of either of these wonderful books by pressing the big green button below me on your screen. If you do, we will send it to you and it will come with a beautiful signed book plate. Uh, we can ship it to you or for local patrons, we are offering curbside pickup at any of our locations. So for your convenience, green button below me. Mm -hmm. uh, with that said, I'll hand this over to Lori and Alex and see you in a little bit. Hello, everybody. There's Alex. Yay, we're here. Hey, everyone. Uh, Alex is up in Rochester, New York, and I'm in Philadelphia. And I didn't plan this carefully because the sun is going down. So if the, the sun is going might be moving across my face, but we're going to have so much fun here. Um, Alex, do you have a copy of your book in front of you? Can you I show do. everybody? Ready? It Isn't, look at you brought me the ocean. And here is Wonder Woman Tempest Tossed. What's super cool is that in the back of my book, um, there's a teaser for Alex's book. So if you, if you get mine and you can see how amazing it is. So we thought that we would talk to you guys a little bit about our process. Um, because this was Alex's first graphic novel, my second, um, and our first, both of us, first time that we've worked with DC. So what was it like for you to have to like figure out what it's supposed to look like and explain how your process with the panels and things like that? Well, there, there's so much to talk about that I think it might be best that we break this up into chunks. So, so <laughs> okay. first of all, let me say that it, at the start, it was both exciting and scary yeah. because I hadn't done a graphic novel before. So, uh, you know, when I first got the, the call from DC, I was like, now you all understand that I've never written a graphic <laughs> novel before. And uh, just to make sure, and they're like, yeah, 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 but you know how to tell a story. And that's what, really what we're looking for. And uh, we'll give you, you know, the training to do the, uh, the to learn how to do the, the drawing. But I guess that's a really fundamental point that, that in essence, it is storytelling is just one, one more way to, to tell, tell a story. So uh, for me to, to start with one of the chunks, one of the big differences was that it's such a collaborative process that usually um, when I write a standard text prose novel, I've written the whole thing and turned it into the, the editor and then I mm -hmm. did a tutorial letter back with comments. And this was much more working hands-on with the editor, you know, starting with a synopsis and then breaking it down into chunks. So we would work together on the first 25%. And then once that was done, then sent that off to the artists so that they could start their work and then working on the next 25%. So it's much more collaborative. 
How about for you, Laurie? I loved it. And I, I really, um, you know, for me, uh, so I'm, I'm, and we all have to explain what our books are about too. The, the story behind my book is that um, I'm writing about Diana at age 16, which was so much fun. Um, and, and when I, I had the experience of turning the, my novel Speak into the Speak graphic novel, so I had, you know, so I understood about having to, you know, when, when writers are doing the scripts, we actually make notes to the artists about what we want to see in each panel. And do we want to see a close up or should it be like a double huge important art spread at, at like critical moments in the story? So I, I, that, that didn't scare me so much. Um, but I actually just had so much fun with it. I don't, this was, first of all, Wonder Woman's been my hero since I was 10, which is a very long time ago. And she has so much to do with me when I was like a young teen, trying to figure out like how to be, how I wanted to be a woman in the world. Because my version of being a woman was very different from the women in my family. So in Diana, I was able to see, you know, a lot of strength and power and intelligence that, that, that really spoke to me. But for me, I started the book on Themyscira, which allowed my artist, Leila Del Duca, to just go wild with the beauty of this mystical island of the Amazons. And then I brought it into New York. And when I was working on the first draft, I never thought about how the artist style might change between those two really important locations. I mean, and when I got to New York, I had like in the park and in the apartment building and in the United Nations. But Layla was so great at like bringing a different feel visually. Um, I think that even though this is the second graphic novel and I had such a great experience with Emily Carroll with the speak graphic novel, in both books, um, what the artist brought to the table just blew me away. It was astounding, astounding. Who's the artist for your book? So the artist for uh, You Brought Me the Ocean is Julie Merrill, mm -hmm. who's uh, best known for uh, the graphic novel, Blue is the Warmest Color, oh. which was turned into uh, a Cannes uh, Grand Prize award-winning film. Wow. So uh, a lot of people know the movie and, and the graphic novel is, is just awesome. And uh, their, their illustrations for, for you, you brought me the ocean are just, and they're, they're unlike your typical uh, comic book illustrations. And uh, they're, they're just, they're really magical. They're just like, like works of art, each, yeah. each drawing. It's just, just incredible. What, what, were there any surprises for you about how different scenes were depicted or what characters looked like? Yeah, so, you know, going back to your question about, you know, the process of, of uh, the graphic novel, and I guess, you know, everyone, I think everyone knows Wonder Woman. Right. Everyone may not know Aqualad, who's another DC character. And during that first call, uh, that was another part of my, you know, nervousness and excitement was that, you know, we have this character Aqualad, which I personally was not, not familiar with, but they said that, uh, you know, and it, like so many of these these uh, superheroes, they go through different versions, iterations. Right. right. And so, in a previous version, uh, Aqualad had identified as gay, but they hadn't del delved so deeply into his story. Mm -hmm. Because in a comic book, you can only go so deep emotionally, as yeah. opposed, you know, a thirty-page comic book, as opposed to a hundred and eighty, a two hundred-page uh, graphic novel, where you can really go into the emotional. Story, which they emphasized that's really what they they wanted to focus on. Right. And so uh, the story is about the character who will become Aqualad, and this is his origin story. But it's a superhero origin story, unlike any other you've ever read, because it's also a coming out story, and it's uh, also uh, a wonderful boy boy romance story. So all tied together into into this uh you know a su superhero story mm. and your heart just fills fills up fills up um so we know i know i know about the the love and we know about the coming out um are there any do you have any villains in your book so you know one of the things that excited me 
when when they you know proposed this idea to me about writing the story and they were great about saying now really make this story your own mm -hmm. if you want to have elements pre from previous versions of aqua that's that's fine but don't you know burden yourself with research really make this story your own mm -hmm. And so I thought, you know, what a wonderful opportunity. And like you said, so much fun yeah. to think back, you know, what would I ha have liked to see as a young person struggling with my sexuality? Uh, you know, that possibility, that potential in, in terms of uh, a, a superhero. So, uh, yeah, so that, that was the fun of it, you know, bringing elements of, of my own uh, growing up uh, into the story. And I completely blanked on what was the question. You asked. That's all right. You answered a lot. We'll come back to it. <laughs> we all have, we all have our brains have all been a little um, affected by stress. So everybody gets a pass for for, for uh, not remembering everything. One of the things that I wanted to bring up was because you're right. Everybody knows who Wonder Woman is. Um, I was given free reign. They said, "Don't worry about continuity. You have to just." They, she has to be 16 and you have to start on Themyscira and somehow get her to the U.S. Um, and so for me, I, you know, it's funny because you, when you write a book, you think you know what you're writing a book about. But then you look back on it, you're like, oh, no, this is a whole deeper level than I thought. So Diana is the only teenager that has ever lived on Themyscira, right? Because all of the other Amazons, boom, were created by the goddesses at one moment. And they were all adults. So since Diana has been the only baby, the, she's the one, every time she goes through another growth spurt, all the Amazons are like, well, now what is she doing? And then she hits puberty. <laughs> and I can, I really pulled heavily from like, when I went through puberty, I was like, what is going on, right? I came from, my mom was a little bit old fashioned, so I didn't know very much about what was going on. And so I, originally I wanted to play with, you know, how confusing it is and how emotional, I, mean, I was so emotional when I was, you know, 14, 15 years old, and my emotions were very big and broad. And sometimes I felt really weak. And sometimes I felt like I could change the world tomorrow if they would just let me. Um, now, I wrote this book in the early part of 2018. And I, I didn't go and see the Wonder Woman movie until everything was turned in, thank goodness. Um, but now that the book has come out in this time, in this time when we are seeing our teenagers and our young adults again, again, leading the country to do better, right? They're in the protests, they're, they're defending, um, you know, everyone's right to be, everyone's right to, to be married, to be in love in whatever identity they have, right? They're leading the calls for racial justice, they're leading the calls for climate change. And so now I'm actually seeing my own story a little bit differently because it, I'm, I'm seeing Diana as having been raised in tremendous privilege. In the, she's been raised on Themyscira in the privilege of not knowing that the world is an unfair place. Um, in my book, she, when she finds out what homelessness is, she's stunned. She's stunned. Um, when she gets catcalled the first time, she jacks the guys up on the side of the building. That was one of my favorite spreads. Um, but I see now her story can be read as sort of that, that transformation that happens to, especially kids who come from some privilege and some safety. Um, coming into the adult world, their eyes are opening up and they're like, whoa, this really sucks. <laughs> you guys, you adults, you've totally screwed it up. But that's good because we're here and we can fix this now. So I remember now the question that you asked me. Okay, good. <laughs> I forgot about the villains. The villains. The villains. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every good story has a villain. So if if y'all hear us, so like I said, Aqualad isn't that well known, but almost everyone knows Aquaman, uh, who's different from Aqualad. But uh, Aquaman has this villain, Black Manta, who is also a villain for Aqualad. Mm -hmm. And so if you if you know if you know um, the DC universe. You'll know the connection of Black Panther to uh, Aqualad, but if you don't, I don't want to spoil it for you. You'll find out when you read the book. But one of the exciting things about writing this was that, you know, for, for queer people, we often identify with superheroes because, you know, like us oftentimes growing up, you know, we have the secret identity, right. you know, our right. true self, our true sexual self that we don't you know, uh, divulge to the world, we don't reveal to the world. Of course. And so, and so 
and like superheroes, then we also end up, you know, living these double lives. Yeah. So young people, you know, maybe that we're out at school, but not at home or out at, at church, but not at school or, you know, yeah. what, whatever it is, we end up living these double lives. So for me, part of what was exciting about writing this book was, was really pushing that metaphor mm. so that you have uh, the coming out story at the same time where you have Jake Hyde, the, our protagonist, discovering his superpowers. So he's both coming to terms with his sexuality as he's coming to terms with his superpower. And then to push that, that metaphor further then you know, the, the super villain that, you know, so oftentimes as queer people we face growing up is homophobia or right. transphobia. Right. It's like this huge super villain that's, you know, always out there that we have to, that we have to be on guard for and, and, and deal with. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> nice. I, I didn't want to have a superhero or supernatural villain in my book. Um, you know, I'm, most, I'm, I'm mostly known for writing about realistic things, um, the real kind of stuff that, that people have, kids have to deal with day in and day out. And I wanted Diana to experience that too, which is why I brought her to New York City. Um, and the, 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 I saw an image in the newspaper months before um, I started working on this project. And I, it's one, you know, we all see things that sometimes, like I don't want to unsee it because it changed me seeing this photograph, um, but it's it's with me. It's a part of me now. And it was a photograph taken in the Mediterranean Sea, where sadly um, a boat filled with refugees who were trying to escape war and devastation went down, and the people all died, and their life preservers were washed up onto the shore. And so this was some folks. I think they were in Greece picking up the life preservers. And this one person picked up the life preserver the size that you would put on an infant. And that just broke me. It really, really did. Um, so that, that's, and actually I, I pulled that into the story a little bit, but my villain <laughs> is a developer in the United States. He's a real estate developer. And um, as so not all real estate developers are villains, but this guy's really, really sleazy and corrupt. Um, and he's got fingers into companies that, that traffic in human beings, child trafficking. Um, he wants to gentrify and destroy neighborhoods that are doing just fine, thank you, and take away people's parks. It's, it, this is the, I, I, maybe we need to do a little bit more of this, or maybe I need to write more of these books because when we make, all of our villains, sometimes they need to be like metaphorical, but we also have to teach everybody how to recognize the villains who are wearing human, human skin, who are, you know, uh, making a bazillion dollars and not paying taxes and who are manipulating stock prices and making sure that families can't get the medication they need for their children. Those are just as scary as some of the ones that you'll see in any superhero universe. Or scarier. Yeah, yeah, really, because they hurt us. They hurt the people we love. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, did you want to, do you know the name of your colorist and your letterer for your book? Uh, the colorist, see, that, that that was part of what was so exciting about the artwork that, yeah. that Jewel Moreau, they really did, they did everything. And I asked them, you know, wow. do you do anything uh, digital? And they were like, no, no. I love the phrase they said. Uh, Every day I come to the page and it's it's hand to paper combat. Wow! And uh, it was just astounding that they were able to uh, produce. So every every page, like a comic book, it's you know an average of four to six panels, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that they cranked out you know five pages a week. Of wow! Four to six panels, the occasional wow. spread or. or yeah the two pager or splash you know, yeah. one page one page thing but uh it was just i don't know how they did it <laughs> that's impressive that's really so we had a whole team we had team diana all women who worked on this our colorist is this great woman i think she's in canada now named kelly fitzgerald um and uh she's on both both Layla del duca the artist and kelly 
and I were all over social media. And our letterer is Saida Temofante, but she's smart. She's not on, on, on social media. Um, so she probably has more time to work, but it was so cool to have for me, since I had different people doing the things I, so I would get Layla's illustrations. And then once everything was approved, it would go to Kelly who would then put the different colors and the palettes in, which boom, just made everything pop. And then Saida went in and, and, and did all the text work. Uh, so it was really, really fun. Really, really fun. What have what kind of uh, feedback have you had? Your book's been out for a couple weeks now. Mine's been out for a month, so five weeks. So, any any surprises in the feedback? No, no. It's been a sort of continuation with my with my other books, where you know we we talk, you know, in in young adult uh, circles with the uh, uh, Rudine Sims Bishop, you know, the yeah. mirrors and windows. And again, that's what's happening with with this book. Nice. You know, in terms of, uh, you know, queer young people who it's like that validation of, you know, seeing ourselves in, in print yeah. and how empowering that is. And yeah. then for non-queer readers, this, you know, window into the life of what's it like, you know, for my LGBTQ friends right. uh, growing up. Right. And so uh, one comment uh, one teen said was, you know, someone hears me. Uh, they read oh. the book and they're like, someone here. Oh, man. So, yeah. Doesn't get like any better that. than that. But you get this stuff all the time. It, does, it never gets old. And, <laughs> and, it, and I, I always remember that, it's, you know, it's, 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 first of all, it's so validating as a writer yeah, when exactly. somebody connects with your stuff. And for every person who comes and shares that with us, that's the first time that person has said that to us. So it's new for our relationship with that reader. Um, so it's just such a joyful work that we do. Um, I feel very, very fortunate. Uh, it's, and, and now to, to, you know, to be expanding, like the, the book I did before this one, Shout, that was a memoir in free verse. So that was something completely different. Then I did uh, Wonder Woman Tempest Tossed. I'm doing another book with DC. Um, for the first time, I'm editing, editing an anthology called wow. Wonder Women of History. Let's where's my Wonder Woman. There she is. This is actually what I look like on the inside for the record. Um, but Wonder Women of History is a, a collection of work by incredible artists and writers. All the writers have chosen a different woman, either in the world today or historically, who made a significant difference, who changed some, changed the world, changed the culture, changed the law. Um, and uh, so I'm starting to see the scripts come in for that right now. I'm starting to see the art and I'm sort of the midwife for this book. So I'm, I, I don't have to do anything too difficult except to cheer on from the sidelines. Um, but that, that'll come out on December 1st and it's all, it's, you know, it's a graphic novel style. So it's full art and it's beautiful. So what do you like, what do you like most about working now with graphic? you know, a book as opposed to standard uh, prose text? They, they both have strengths. They have different strengths. Um, with, with prose text, I like to play with language. Um, so you can real, at least I just, I have to be careful because I can go off on that a little bit more than most readers want to read. Um, but with the, the the graphic novel, anything that's, that's visual, you're speaking a different language, right? You're trying to communicate the heart of the story um, in image. And I actually think that, that working on graphic novels is making me into a better writer because it's teaching me how to structure my stories a little bit more tightly, you know, because each action has to lead to the next action. And sometimes if you write a scene properly, they don't have to say much. Right, you let the actions carry the strength of the scene, and that I think pulls the reader in a little bit farther. So I really enjoy it, and I, I enjoy doing both. But it's fun, it's so fun when you're a writer. A lot of a lot of parts of being a writer really sucks because it's hard, and you know, health insurance, and it's hard to break in. But it's 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 one of those rare careers that you keep growing, you keep learning, and and that keeps me engaged. I like that. What about you? Well, that's part of that's part of what I loved about doing this this graphic novel that mm -hmm. that it was so new and learning so much and yeah. and again going back to that collaboration it was just so energizing. Yeah. So between the collaboration and just learning these these new techniques and and having that ability with uh, a graphic novel to to see what it's going to look like on the page. 
So, you know, putting that hook in that, you know, last panel, you know, by that bottom right panel, you know, to move, move the page. That's forward right. To oh, be able I to see that. that. Love it. Love yeah. that. So, yeah. so yeah, that was so exciting for me. And uh, so I'm working on a memoir now, mm -hmm. of my immigrant experience, you know, coming, nice. coming to the U U.S. and growing up uh, an immigrant. And I, I've been so enthused by this that I'm doing illustrations for it. Are you I, really? haven't, I haven't written since, I mean, I haven't drawn since I was a boy. Wow. And I, I'm looking back and it's like, why did I stop drawing? Yeah. Because I just love it so much. Yeah. And so my writing group that I belong to, where, you know, we yeah. share each other's writings, now I'm mm -hmm. sharing my drawings with them. Oh, Alex, I am so happy for you. That's <laughs> and, fabulous. Well, thank you, thank you, Lori. And and yeah, just you know what what I what I've learned you know in this process when you brought me the ocean of how much can be conveyed you know the old adage about you know a picture is worth a thousand yeah. words just how much can be communicated in in an image that is the truth that is <laughs> the truth so so is the memoir the next project that you have it's it's what I'm working on now yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm actually doing graphic novel adaptations for my historical fiction. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and then I've got other stuff, but the other stuff is so raw in my brain, you know, it's just like, I don't dare talk about it because I'm superstitious that way. Um, I think we're, we're, are we ready to go to questions? Sure, absolutely. Are, are you ready to go to questions? Y'all have some questions? While we're waiting to get, oh, here we, here she comes. Hang on, I'm gonna, <laughs> while, while you're talking, I'm gonna type in the name of an educator I know who uses comics and graphic novels to teach social studies. And he's got an incredible website for any educators or families out there watching. You wanna, this guy is gonna help make your life a lot better. So I'm just gonna type that in while you talk, my friend. Okay, let's see, where should I start? I think I'll start here. Did you feel any kind of anxiety about offering fresh perspectives for these iconic characters with such long-standing histories? You guys kind of talked about that. But. Yeah, so for for me, what I did was is, you know, I couldn't help myself from doing some research. And so what I did is, is I did choose elements from previous Aqualad versions the elements that I thought resonated most for me. But uh, again, you know, DC was just so encouraging of, you know, really make the story your own and, and you know, working so closely with the editor and trust, so her name's Sarah Miller, just wonderful, and trusting her judgment that uh, she, if I started getting off on the wrong track in terms of the character that she would let me know. But uh, she was so creative and she, you know, has worked on so many uh, comics and graphic novels that, you know, I just trusted her that if, if it worked for her, that it would work for, for, for other readers. How about you, Laurie? Yeah, I was, I was, it's, you have to be careful because you can get terrified, right? Um, Wonder Woman's been around for 80 years. Um, she's the same age as my Aunt Norma. Um, <laughs> and, and, and there's been different iterations and the different iterations, of course, always reflect the culture uh, and the time period in which they're written. And I knew that I was following um, in the footsteps of giants who had created this seminal uh, character that clearly changed my life. She also was really important to Gloria Steinem growing up. I think Wonder Woman has graced more covers of Ms. Magazine than any other person alive or imaginary. So I was, I, I was not scared, but I was trying to be reverent at the same time, wanting to put my own spin on things. Um, and so there's, there's some Easter eggs in there instead of having, I didn't want to have a romantic story that, that to me, Diana is like learning to figure out who she is. You don't always have to have a romantic interest. So instead of having Steve, Trevor, or whatever version of him, I had Steve and Trevor. These are two men who are husbands to each other, and they are important mentors for her. There's an, uh, an older woman in the book who's a grandmotherly kind of figure, Diana lives with her, and she's a Polish immigrant, and her name is the Polish equivalent of Etta Candy. Um, so little things like that, I tried to make a nod um, to everybody who came before me. 
And also, you know, again, with the help of editors, um, sensitivity readers, you know, great artists, try to contribute to, to the next version. The next question I have for you is, can you both talk about the ways that you address safety versus danger and empowerment for teen readers in 2020? <laughs> Mm. That's a big one. That is a really big one. Safety versus danger. Um, well, you know, I talked earlier about how Diana coming from such a sheltered environment, like paradise, literally, she grew up in paradise, nothing is wrong in paradise. Um, coming to the real world, um, especially the real world that's got scary people in it and people who can hurt, who want to hurt vulnerable folks. Um, that is a journey that I know a lot of my readers are taking. And in my experience as, you know, YA author has been around for a while, I know that we don't do our kids any favors when we don't talk to them about these things, when we don't show them stories where these things can happen. Um, this is why literature is so important in the lives of every family and of every kid, because you, you want your kids, you want yourself as a child, as a teen, to learn about what's real, what's out there, where the monsters are hiding, you want to learn about that in a book, if at all possible, before it confronts you, before it gets in your face. And if you are somebody who's been harmed by the monsters of the world, hopefully you'll find stories that will help you uh, make sense of what happened, kind of help you work on your trauma um, and do some healing and some growing from that. Um, when people talk to me about censorship a lot, I often say that censorship has nothing to do with keeping children safe, although that's how it's often presented. It has to do with keeping the adults in their world safe from having to have these conversations with kids. Um, and, and, you know, we, we, we're still all struggling as adults trying to learn how do we keep our kids safe and how do we prepare them for the world. Um, I know that stories is the, the best way to do that. And I forgot the other half of your question. Um, it was about but let, let, Yeah, well, we'll do empowerment. But Alex, what do you think about that? It was the safety and the danger? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I love it. And it's like, it's so much of what the book is about because mm. uh, the protagonist, Jake Hyde, it's, it's uh, you know, he's, he's scared of coming out. And in the reality is that, that, you know, for many young people coming out, it's not safe. Right. And so a lot of the book is, okay, so if it's, if it's not safe, how to, how to work through that. And so a sort of an, an embodiment of, of, you know, fear is his, his mom who's so overprotective mm -hmm. and for her own reasons that are revealed during the book. But I mean, she's like the extreme of, you know, wanting to keep him safe. And his struggle is, well, I just, you know, I can't keep hiding myself all my life. And so then the other character, uh, Kenny, uh, the boy who uh, Jake crushes on, he's totally out and open and, and risk taking and the rebel. And, you know, just says, I, I don't care yeah, yeah, if it's dangerous, I gotta be, I gotta be me. Yeah. And so during the course of the story, you know, what you said about mentors and that there are these mentors in the story. There's a, a school teacher and then his best friend's dad. And um, so how uh, young people can, you know, navigate through that issue of safety and danger uh, through community, mm. you know, reaching reaching out to other people, whether they're their peers, like in this case, Kenny, or whether they're adults, you know, safe adults, you know, trusted adults, maybe they're parents, maybe they're not parents, but that they exist out there. So I'll go ahead and answer the empowerment and then turn it over to you. Okay, that's fair, go ahead. So, so what ends up happening is, you know, that again, the, the, the metaphor, you know, pushing that, that metaphor in this book that, you know, we discover our superpowers when we can truly be who we are. And in this case, you know, so much of that for, for Jake is, you know, being true to his sexual identity, right. his uh, sexual orientation, uh, that innermost uh, self. And so, you know, what I hope, uh, you know, readers take away from the book is that is that message, be true to who you are. There's never been anyone else like you in the universe ever, and there never will be again, you know, that's your unique voice. And when you claim that, when you can claim that voice, 
that's that's your superpower. Mm. So in that sense, the book is all about uh, empowerment and navigating safety and danger. Oh, I love that, Alex. <laughs> Nailed it. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, you have to. I'm glad we're recording this because you're going to want to <laughs> like make posters and T-shirts. Um, that would be a, a, a great writing prompt too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for for me, I wanted to show when it comes to empowerment that 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 it's messy, like like most parts of human growth. Um, you don't like wake up one day and go, oh, I'm really powerful now. Uh, you you're all like speaking for myself and and my friends and family. Like we're scared most of the time, and you know, Daddy used to say, being brave is not about the absence of fear. Being brave is doing hard things despite and with the fear. And you learn how to do that a little bit at a time, when, and especially when you identify like what you care about. I never ask teenagers, what are you gonna be when you grow up? I ask them, what problems would do you wanna solve? Because when you figure out what problems like really make you frustrated or upset or I gotta go fix this, then you know that like, that's your heart sending you a message saying, this is what we, where we need to dive into. Um, and, and so the empowerment of Diana is very much a 16 year old. So she's got not great ideas sometimes. She kind of acts without thinking and then there's consequences. But as she's going through all these different adventures and you know running up against hard things, that makes her stronger. And by the end of the book, you know, you see her finally kind of, you know, f she becomes um, Wonder Woman instead of just being Diana. Um, and we all have, like, like Alex said, we all have that superhero inside of us. Um, but it's, it's, it's never easy. It's always messy and slow. Yeah. Okay, got another one here that is, will this pandemic change the way you write or your perspective in future writings or the way you speak to young adults, especially in light of the paradigm of power that have influenced much of how we have dealt with it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I've, I've never uh, shied away from political conversations, but I'm really grateful that um, that we are that in all the darkness and the, the suffering sadly, of so many families that we are in a place where um, where we're seeing power dynamics at work. Um, one of the one of the worst things that has happened in education in the last twenty years is that schools. Um, have had to, or they think they've had to, the administration tells them they have to cut back on the teaching of social studies, government, civics, politics, so to create more time for the tests. I'm trying really hard not to curse here. I'm really trying hard because I want to. Um, and, and so we have the, the fact that we're in such a tumultuous time right now, really good things can come out of that. Um, and so for me, it's, it's, I'm going to be speaking up even louder and longer, especially in my work, about what inequity looks like. Um, and about if you, if you were born in privilege, if you, if you kind of like Diana, had kind of a Themyscira-esque upbringing and life has been good and comfortable, don't feel bad about that. That's awesome. I'm really happy for the people who had those experiences. But use that. You have power if that was your, how you were, you were raised. Um, and you can use that kind of power to make sh make the world more equitable for everybody, for all of our brothers and sisters and siblings in this country. We're, we're, we're really good about saying things about democracy. We suck at actually enacting them. I think the time has come to change that. Yeah, for me, I, I suppose it'll change how I write, but I don't know. At this point, I feel like I'm so in the midst of it and the thick of it that I don't know. I don't know. It's like, you know, I, I write about, uh, you know, young people because that's where more, more of my voice is. And yet it's been a long time since I was a, a young person. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, I have this distance from it that allows me to, to you know, channel channel that that voice so uh I, I as i say i think it'll affect me but i don't i don't know how yeah we'll see so here's a question for alex did you find your counseling training helpful in writing your books good question 
Yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's a good question. It, I, I think, you know, having been a counselor and having been through counseling, it's like it, it helped me to have more empathy and understanding, uh, compassion uh, of, of uh, you know, other people and of myself. And so to understand characters, uh, see into their, their hearts, their hearts better. Uh, but what I have to watch out for is when, you know, I'm writing uh, about young people that I really step into their voice, mm. their voices, and not write as an adult counselor. Yeah. And that's why I really need uh, an editor to work with. And they're saying, wait a minute, this doesn't sound like a teenager <laughs> voice. Sounds like a counselor. Yeah. I'm like, oops. Yeah. Do you know what, what other YA author is famously, has been a child therapist for, I think, all of his adult life? Chris? Chris Crutcher. Yeah, yeah. Chris Crutcher. You guys are good. Very good at what you do. Oh, thank you. So is there an author or book that you guys could point to as being most formative for you as a writer and a creator? Yeah, actually. Um, cause I read this just as I was beginning, um, to try my hand at writing novels. Um, it was the Watsons go to Birmingham, 1963 by Christopher Paul Crutcher, or not Crutcher, Crutcher Christopher, <laughs> Christopher Paul Curtis, so many Chris's, um, and, and such a powerful, powerful book. Um, it is set in, um, uh, 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, where those, those four little girls were murdered in the church, but it starts out so funny, right? It's like, you don't, I had no idea. I, I didn't know what the book was. It just, it came out. People said, oh, you should, you should read this. And the, I sat down in the library and read the whole thing in the library. And it, I almost, it was so funny in the beginning, which just made me fall in love with the characters. And then by the time you get to like the really sorrowful, powerful scenes at the end, I was sobbing. And so it really taught me a lot about, first of all, how you can use humor even in books that are quite serious. And you know, we, our, t our kids always use humor too, even in times like this. Kids and teenagers are wicked funny and they're always using humor as a, as a defense mechanism. So I've tried to put those in all of my books and uh, yeah, I've learned a lot from him. For me, I, I, I can't point to, to one author. It's like, you know, I, I just have loved so many, so many authors. So in terms of, uh, you know, queer, queer authors, uh, Edmund, Edmund White, and uh, he wrote a book called The Boy's Own Story. And he just had, he said, he, to me, he just showed such courage and things that he wrote about there just so, so openly that that really empowered me to write about, uh, you know, issues around sexuality more more openly and, and honestly. Uh, Willa Cather and her imagery, I, I love uh, of the real uh, classics, Tolstoy. I love Tolstoy, again, his, his characters and imagery. But it's like, there's so many, you know, I, I, I you know, I walk into libraries or bookstores and I just feel so small in comparison to <laughs> all, these, all these books and authors, great books. Yeah. yeah. So I have a question for you, Lori. Um, you wrote Fever 1793 and did all of the research for that novel. What comparisons do you see between that time and this time? You know, it's really interesting because I was supposed to go to India in February for three weeks. And um, because I know more than is probably healthy for a non-medical person to know about epidemics because of the research on that book, I canceled the trip as soon as I started to read about Wuhan. Um, cause we didn't know at that point that back in January, you know, where was it going to land next? And, and I, I know how quickly things can fall apart. Um, you know, what drew me to that story in fever 1793 is it's set in Philadelphia during the real yellow fever epidemic that hit that year, that summer This is when uh, Philly was the capital of the United States. Washington was president, Hamilton and Jefferson were in town. Um, and it's, it was such a scary, it reminded me so much in, in the early days of COVID because they didn't know how, what was causing yellow fever and they didn't know how to treat it. And we're still learning about COVID every single day. And just like in that epidemic in 1793, those really hard, terrifying situation brought out the best in some people and it brought out the worst in others. 
you know, in, 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 in normal times, as things are going well, people, people get to kind of make the, a, a face that is presentable to society. But when times get tough, that's when you find out what people are really made of. Um, and I see that happening now with COVID. Um, and I think also there's a similar thing happening where kids are having to learn hard things about life. Um, now, back in the late 1700s in the United States, they didn't really have this notion of adolescence that we have in the modern Western world today. Um, I think our kids are protected most, in some places a little bit longer from realities. But the truth is, is that the kids can handle it. They, you know, they're smart and they want to know what's going on and they want to know how to help. I loved seeing um, uh, the, the, the Sesame Street Muppets and CNN and they've done some great things um, where they're talking to families about how do you talk to your four, I've got a four year old grandson and he's, he knows all about the, the stinky germs he calls them. <laughs> and we all have to wear our masks to make the stinky germs go away. And uh, so it's uh, hard times. You don't want anybody to have to go through times like that, but let's be really aware of the good that can come out of it. Um, and uh, you know, communities and families coming together, bonding together to make sure everyone's going to be okay. That's a good thing. Okay. I've got two more questions that I, I think are fun ones. Okay. Um, so the first is what, how are you reading lately? And you know, what, what is your favorite book you've read so far in 2020? That's for me. Oh, I think it is Tiffany D. Jackson's grown. Um, that comes out in, I think they moved it up to September. Yeah. Um, there's a, go on my Instagram and you'll see it. It's astounding. Um, it's a me too story, uh, with it, intersectionality. Um, too often we only talk about sexual violence. Like it only happens to white girls and white women. And that is not the case. And so she takes on all kinds of, of, of things, um, in this book. And she's such a master because she's such a good writer and she's so good at writing tension. So that's, um, that, oh, and my other favorite book for this year is already out. It's called Prairie Lotus and it was written by Linda Sue Park. And it's Linda's take on the Dakota territories, um, that Laura Ingalls Wilder wrote about in a very racist and, and damaging way but it's an important pioneer time and space. And Linda Sue, as a Korean American kid, wanted to see somebody who looked like her in that time and place. And she's created it and it's her masterpiece. It's an extraordinary piece of writing and, and storytelling. And it's, it's hard and it's joyful. And I encourage everybody to get a copy. For me, you know, since I, since I started working on, on You Brought Me the Ocean, it's like in order to learn more about graphic novels, I just started reading so many of them. So uh, I, I continue to just love them. And one that, that I loved was uh, Mariko Tamaki's Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me. Yeah. It's just hilarious and, and painful and just wonderful. Yeah, nice. That's a great book. All right, guys, so here's my last question for you. If you could have a superhero, a superpower, what would it be and why? And also what would your superhero name be? <laughs> this is a real question, I forgot. I would uh, change um, the Supreme Court ruling that allowed um, basically all kinds of lobbying money to come into the United States. I would, I would outlaw lobbying and I would make uh, politicians responsible to and responsive to the people who actually elected them to office. And um, my superhero name will be Nana Justice. <laughs> That's great. <Thank> you. <laughs> what about you, Alex? Well, I used to say my, my superpowers was, was writing because that's really where I channel, you know, who I am to the world connect. That's how I connect to the world. But now it's, it's drawing. So, and yeah. I feel like that, that superpower really is developing. So to be able to be a super drawer, so for now that would be my name. And everyone would be like, what? <laughs> nice. okay. Sounds great. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And thank you to everyone you. who tuned in from all over the planet, really. Mm -hmm. um, 
We have a lot of virtual events coming up this month. So follow us on social media, sign up for our email blast so you don't miss out. Again, green button below us on the screen. You can order either of these books, Wonder Woman Tempest Tossed, or You Brought Me the Ocean from Books and Books, and you will get a signed book plate in the mail. We're really good at shipping books and we Yay. love to you some. So please um, pick one up and we'll see you again soon. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Laurie. All right.